Hey everyone, welcome to Hands-On Books. If this is your first time here, it's a show where we open mostly used books from my ever-growing pile, and this is the obligatory, it's been too long since I made one of these and the pile is getting out of hand comment. First up is a book that I already know what it is, um, but since I bought it new, I want to figure out if it's in good enough condition to keep. This is Beyond the Horizon, The Art of John Harris. This is one of those guys who did so many cool, um, so many cool works of art for different science fiction books throughout the years and I've been looking at buying this for a while and I finally decided to. Alright, let's check it out. John Harris has been painting pictures of imaginative realism since the mid-1970s. A preoccupation with scale and atmosphere are the hallmarks of his work and its DNA shows a clear connection to the English Romantic tradition and its focus. Executed in a traditional way of oil on canvas, many of the pieces are on a large scale. In 1984, NASA invited him to Cape Kennedy to witness a launch of the space shuttle and record the event in a painting, the first British artist to be honored so. That work now hangs in the Kennedy Space Center and is part of the Smithsonian collection. Over the last 30 years, he has continued to produce works for science fiction covers for many of the great names in the genre, including Isaac Asimov, Arthur C. Clarke, Ben Bova, Orson Scott Card, and John Scalzi, to name a few. World-renowned visionary artist John Harris's unique paintings capture the universe on a massive scale featuring everything from vast landscapes and towering cities to immensely beautiful science fiction vistas. This defining collection focuses on his wide variety of futuristic paintings, sketches, acrylics, and watercolors, as well as his striking covers for a variety of esteemed SF authors, including John Scalzi, Ben Bova, Jack McDevitt, Orson Scott Card, and many more. Looks like it's in good condition. Here I recognize this sort of art. Maybe it's the exact painting from John Scalzi's um, Old Man's War. Yeah, I'll read Scalzi's foreword. In my career as an author, I found John Harris's work incredibly inspiring. And no, I don't mean that simply as a compliment. I mean it in the sense that a significant part of my written work started with me staring at a picture of his artwork and having ideas come from there. The best example of this is my novel, The Ghost Brigades, part of my Old Man's War series. Tor, my publisher, decided to have John do the art for trade paperback of Old Man's War and at the same time commission the cover to The Ghost Brigades, which I was then writing, because sometimes in publishing you get a cover even before you have a manuscript. My editor showed both to me with a flourish. Both were quintessential John Harris space art, vibrantly covered, impressionist yet technical implying a whole universe outside the borders of the cover. As it happened, as Patrick was showing me these covers, I had written myself into a corner with the Ghost Brigades. I needed to move the story forward, but I was a bit at a loss as to how to do it. John's cover for the book showed a space station hovering above the ring system of an otherwise Earth-like planet. And as I looked at John's art, I could almost physically feel the gears engage in my head. I knew what that planet was and why it was important and why a space station would be near its ring system, and I went off to write, happily unjammed. The cover to the Ghost Brigades describes the content of the novel because it inspired it. And speaking as the author, I can say that the book is better because of John's cover. It was the first time I've used his work as a creative spur, but it's not been the last. This isn't surprising to me because I knew John's work as a reader long before I worked with him as a creator. 
John's artwork, like that of Richard Powers or Frank Kelly Fries, is iconic and also bookstore iconic, which is to say you can see it from across a bookstore. And when you see it, you know, you know that you're going to get in the pages of that book, a damn fine read that takes you places you can't go any other way. People forget that cover art isn't just good art. It's also, in a practical sense, a form of advertisement. It's also, in a very real way, a promise. Perhaps it's unfair to put all that on the artist, to require the artist to promote the author, assure the reader, and still make good art. But then one of the reasons John Harris is in such demand is that he does all of that. Authors and readers both want what's inside their books to match what's on the outside. I've been lucky to have John as an inspiration. Perhaps his work will inspire you too. I hope it does. John Scalzi. I love this aurora on this Saturn-like planet. I'll read the introduction. The world of science fiction is now so much a part of our culture, it is hard to imagine a time when it was not. The act of fantasizing a future, complete with its social mores, its technology, architecture, fashion, even language, now seems such a natural and commonplace activity, and a defining characteristic of our age. Yet, before the 19th century, the concept of the future was hardly ever considered. The rare occasions when it surfaced was in the domain of satirists and visionaries such as Jonathan Swift and William Blake. But the work of such figures was more about alternative views of reality than of the future. When the Industrial Revolution got underway, all that changed. The concept of technology became the defining force that literally shaped our future and our awareness of it. The advent of writers like H.G. Wells and, later, Arthur C. Clarke and Isaac Asimov brought into the forefront of our awareness the manner of how technology might create new worlds, both metaphoric and actual, to live in. By the 1960s, the generation of SF writers that included Clarke and Asimov had created a distinctive new field of thought, and the real world was only one step behind. John Harris was one week short of 21 when Apollo 19 reached the moon. By this time, he had already absorbed much of the world view of those writers, and they undoubtedly shaped him. This is what he has to say about that. Quote, when I was first introduced to science fiction in the early 60s, there was a flavor to the genre, best expressed by people like the late Arthur C. Clarke, Alfred Bester, George R. Stewart, and Isaac Asimov. I grew up with their books, and their preoccupations became mine. Expansive perspectives, big spaces, and bigger questions. The emotional color that prevailed was, to my eyes, joyous. And to this day, I am still inspired by the visions of those figures of the past. End quote. Much of the work in this collection is undoubtedly hardcore and represents a preoccupation with hardware. But the real meat of these images is the sense of scale, atmosphere, and the space which this junk occupies. And of these three elements, hard to separate, there is often a tussle in the artist's mind as to which is most important. But the one which is most intangible and yet most fulfilling is the sense of atmosphere. Here in these pieces, often with accompanying sketches, the full display of these elements can be seen. Planetary bodies and vast megalithic structures hang weightless in a vaster space, as if awaiting for the last trump. The air crackles with expectations and a sense of imminent thunder. This is the stage that is set, recalling, oddly, the romantic tradition of 19th century artists. It is a collection of images spanning 35 years or more, and while it reveals an evolution of technique, it remains consistent in a vision that aims to inspire. This is for Ben Bova's Saturn. You do get this impressionist sort of feeling. I love this. Like alien trees. That like purple pink palette. Love the lights on the landscape.
Yeah, you can, it's just almost, there's so much going on in each picture. It's not just like a, almost not like a static image. Like this is obviously, or feels to me like some sort of um, maintenance craft. Just from the colors, he seems to imply that. Oh, and this is for a Jack Vance novel that I listened to recently on YouTube, Ports of Call. It was really fun. One of the last ones Vance wrote. Well, with an art book like this, I ran into kind of a similar situation with Gustave Moreau. I don't really have a ton to say about it, but it was just one that I wanted to buy. And the fact that I had it sitting here made me want to film an episode just so I could open it. Um, Yeah, if this is something you like, definitely go check out John Harris. All right, let's open another one. Thank you. Stories of Your Life and Others by Ted Chang. So this is a collection of stories by Ted Chang who wrote the, um, the story behind Arrival. And I bought this specifically because it has uh, the Babel short story, which was recommended to me by one of my friends. At least I hope it has it. Tower of Babylon, yeah. So I'll read the back here in the beginning of that short story. Stories of Your Life and Others delivers dual delights of the very, very strange and the heartbreakingly familiar, often presenting characters who must confront sudden change, the inevitable rise of automatons or the appearance of aliens, while striving to maintain some sense of normalcy. With sharp intelligence and humor, Chang examines what it means to be alive in a world marked by uncertainty, but also by beauty and wonder. An award-winning collection from one of today's most lauded writers, Story of Your Life and Others is a contemporary classic. Tower of Babylon Were the tower to be laid down across the plain of Shinar, it would be two days' journey to walk from one end to the other. While the tower stands, it takes a full month and a half to climb from its base to its summit if a man walks unburdened. But few men climb the tower with empty hands. The pace of most men is slowed by the cart of bricks which they pull behind them. Four months pass between the day a brick is loaded onto a cart and the day it is taken off to form a part of the tower. Hillelum had spent all his life in Elam, and knew Babylon only as a buyer of Elam's copper. The copper ingots were carried on boats that traveled down the Karun to the lower sea, headed for the Euphrates. Hillelum and the other miners traveled overland, alongside a merchant's caravan of loaded onagers. They walked along a dusty path leading down from the plateau across the plains to the green fields sectioned by canals and dikes. None of them had ever seen the tower before. It became visible when they were still leagues away, a line as thin as a strand of flax, wavering in the shimmering air, rising up from the crust of mud that was Babylon itself. As they drew closer, the crust grew into the mighty city walls, but all they saw was the tower. When they did lower their gazes to, to the level of the river plain, they saw the marks the tower had made outside the city. The Euphrates itself now flowed at the bottom of a wide, sunken bed, dug to provide clay for bricks. To the south of the city could be seen rows upon rows of kilns, no longer burning. As they approached the city gates, the tower appeared more massive than anything Hillelum had ever imagined. A single column that must have been as large around as an entire temple, yet rising so high that it shrank into invisibility. All of them walked with their heads tilted back, squinting in the sun. Hillelum's friend Nani prodded him with an elbow, awestruck. We're going to climb that? To the top? Going up to dig? It seems unnatural. The miners reached the central gate in the western wall, where another caravan was leaving. 
while they crowded forward into the narrow strip of shade provided by the wall, their foreman, Belly, shouted to the gatekeepers who stood atop the gate towers. We are the miners summoned from the land of Alam. The gatekeepers were delighted. One called back. You are the ones who are to dig through the vault of heaven? We are. The entire city was celebrating. The festival had begun eight days ago, when the last of the bricks were sent on their way, and would last two more. Every day and night the city rejoiced, danced, feasted. Along with the brickmakers were the cart pullers, men whose legs were roped with muscle from climbing the tower. Each morning a crew began its ascent. They climbed for four days, transferred their loads to the next crew of pullers, and returned to the city with empty carts on the fifth. A chain of such crews led all the way to the top of the tower, but only the bottommost celebrated with the city. For those who lived upon the tower, enough wine and meat had been sent up earlier to allow a feast to extend up the entire pillar. In the evening, Hillelum and the other Elamite miners sat upon clay stools before a long table laden with food, one table among many laid out in the city square. The miners spoke with the pullers, asking about the tower. Nani said, Someone told me that the bricklayers who work at the top of the tower wail and tear their hair when a brick is dropped, because it will take four months to replace, but no one takes notice when a man falls to his death. Is that true? One of the more talkative pullers, Lugatum, shook his head. Oh no, that is only a story. There is a continuous caravan of bricks going up the tower. Thousands of bricks reach the top each day. The loss of a single brick means nothing to the bricklayers. He leaned over to them. However, there is something they value more than a man's life. A trowel. Why a trowel? If a bricklayer drops his trowel, he can do no more work until a new one is brought up. For months he cannot earn the food that he eats, so he must go into debt. The loss of a trowel is cause for much wailing. But if a man falls and his trowel remains, men are secretly relieved. The next one to drop his trowel can pick up the extra one and continue working, without incurring debt. Hillelum was appalled, and for a frantic moment he tried to count how many picks the miners had brought. Then he realized, That cannot be true. Why not have spare trowels brought up? Their weight would be nothing against all the bricks that go up there, and surely the loss of a man means a serious delay, unless they have an extra man at the top who is skilled at bricklaying. Without such a man, they must wait for another one to climb from the bottom. All of the pullers roared with laughter. We cannot fool this one, Lugatum said with much amusement. He turned to Hillelum. So you'll begin your climb once the festival is over? Hillelum drank from a bowl of beer. Yes, I've heard that we'll be joined by miners from a western land, but I haven't seen them. Do you know of them? Yes, they come from a land called Egypt, but they do not mine ore as you do. They, ca they quarry stone. We dig stone in Elam, too, said Nani, his mouth full of pork. Not as they do. They cut granite. Granite? Limestone and alabaster were quarried in Elam, but not granite. Are you certain? Merchants who have traveled to Egypt say they have stone ziggurats and temples, built with limestone and granite, huge blocks of it and they carve giant statues from granite. But granite is so difficult to work. Lugatum shrugged. Not for them. The royal architects believe such stone workers may be useful when you reach the vault of heaven. Hilalum nodded. That could be true. Who knew for certain what they would need? Have you seen them? No, they are not here yet, but they are expected in a few days' time. They may not arrive before the festival ends, though. Then you Elamites will ascend alone. You will accompany us, won't you? Yes, but only for the first four days. Then we must turn back while you lucky ones go on. Why do you think us lucky? I long to make the climb to the top. I once pulled with the higher crews and reached a height of twelve days' climb, but that is as high as I have ever gone. You will go far higher. Lugatum smiled ruefully. I envy you that you will touch the vault of heaven. To touch the vault of heaven, to break it open with picks, Hillelum felt uneasy at the idea. There is no cause for envy, he began. Right, said Nani. When we are done, all men will touch the vault of heaven. I definitely like Chang's writing style.
And I liked the idea of this story because it's one of those that takes the mythology of a story really seriously, literally, where the Tower of Babel is the basis for the diversity of language among mankind because we built it too high, too close to heaven, and it offended God. So that'll be a fun one to finish. Just a quick recap. I know it's only two books, but might as well. Um, the John Harris book was cheaper new than it was used, so I just bought it off of Amazon, and it was less than 20 bucks. Um, definitely satisfied with this. Nice hardback art book. Um, as Scalzi said in his introduction, a good source of inspiration for stories or settings or just a fun thing to have to flip through. Uh, and this Ted Chang book was like 10 bucks off of Abe Books, perfect condition as far as I'm concerned. So definitely happy with both of these purchases. And um, if this is something you like, I definitely want to get back into the swing of making these more often because, like I said, I have a ton of unopened books here that I feel guilty about not being able to open. But um, like I said, if this is something you like, please feel free to like and subscribe, and I hope to post another video soon. So until next time, happy reading. Mm -hmm.